Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of... Kato! My name is Hans. I'm Edward. And we are your hosts for now and always. And forevermore. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Edward? I'm good. Good. Do you Got have a coffee. delicious... Oh, there we go. That's exactly what yeah. I was going to ask. <laughs> yes, I have my coffee. As do I. <laughs> <laughs> I cre- <laughs> You made a video. <laughs> yeah. Shameless self-plug. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we need a sponsor and this is it. So just... Carry yes, on. yes. Um, welcome to <laughs> Gettle, episode 13, sponsored by Hans Haupt and Edward Swart. There we go. Um, Edward is talking about this Nespresso video that I shot recently. Because, um, you know, we're in lockdown and companies aren't really sending things out. And we also can't order things. I mean, I know that sometimes we're privileged enough to receive you know, products for review. And then sometimes I'll do videos on them. But more often than not, I actually end up buying the things that I review. Um, so with that said, I am a lover of coffee. So is Edward. We both have mugs right now, um, yeah. as, as you, <laughs> most of you heard. And so what I did is, is I shot a video on Nespresso's capsule dispensers, uh, the Bon Bonier and the touch sleeve dispenser. So if anyone out there is an espresso drinker, you can find the video link in the podcast description and check it out. Who knows? Yeah, you might learn something new. <laughs> what I like about the video is that it thoroughly explains the differences between the diff- the two different um, <laughs> capsule holders. Look, it's so funny to hear you say that because <laughs> Edward knows this, the public doesn't, but I was cracking myself laughing the entire time I shot this video because I was like, these are capsule dispensers. What am it's I going to say? <laughs> and I, sh- I literally, I shot 30 <laughs> minutes of video for this thing, which I managed to edit down to 10. So, <laughs> I mean, look, I've always been verbose and I used to always get shouted at at school for speaking too much. Well, it's evident that nothing has changed, even as an adult. <laughs> speaking of speaking too much, we're already three minutes in. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Um, let me know, on besides the video, what else have you got going on? <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Moving on, moving on. We all know that we need to treasure the most important woman in our lives. And so we sat down together and we constructed a list of DIY Mother's Day gift ideas, specifically because of the lockdown scenario that most of us are experiencing around the world. Mm. And Edward, I'd like if you could just, you know, lead us through the list of some of yep. your favorite items. And uh, yeah, hopefully you you guys can hear these things and maybe even do them for your mom. Yeah. So, so, so the idea about the gift, well, uh, the list is basically to create something memorable. Um, obviously, moms will always be happy with anything you give them. Most of them will just say they just want appreciation. They Always. want nothing. Always, yeah. Um, so, so the idea we had behind this list is to create something that they'll be able to cherish, something they'll be able to use instead of just the usual, you know, a printout or a card or whatever. Or soap. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or soap <laughs> and deodorant. So basically, we have like interactive cards on the list, um, homemade cookie butter. That, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but that homemade cookie butter is amazing. And my mom probably won't hear this, I don't think. She, I don't think she listens to the podcast. But I have an <laughs> idea of actually mixing some of Oreos that we have, because she loves Oreos, with yeah. Turkish delight that she loves. Oh. So I'm totally doing that before Mother's Day and I'm going to give that to her and hopefully, hopefully I hope she'll like it also hope it'll taste good cookie butter always tastes good like I've never tasted my own I've never made my own which uh, I am going to this weekend um, but I think it'll be amazing the one is about this specific um, cookie butter guide is that it works for any cookie it's it's made to work with any cookie imaginable I dig yeah it. and we also have like we, uh, marble cup, water marble I'm so cups. glad that that's the one that you spoke about next because <laughs> of the items on the list, honestly, those are yeah. the two that I'm most interested in because yes. they're easy to do. I mean, the, yes. the one, the, the cookie dough s- tastes good and it's easy to make. And then the marble cups with nail polish. I mean, yeah. I, I was fascinated when you wrote that and how simple it is. I mean, anybody can do it. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that my friends with children could so do this with exactly. them. Exactly. Like, um, 
I first came across the Marvel Cup thing years back when my sister taught me or, or gave me the idea. Um, apparently, they, they learned it at school. Um, if anyone's wondering what we're talking about, essentially what you do is you take a clear mug. And when I say clear mug, I just mean a mug clear of designs, preferably mm-hmm. a white one. And you dip it in water where you've already pre- placed nail polish. And it makes like a tie-dye marbling effect on the mug. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. It's quick to do. It's fast. You just leave it out to dry for about an hour or two. And that's it. Um, and it looks pretty. <laughs> exactly. And, and when I wrote this list, um, I was already on four points. And then I thought back about this gift I used to make thanks to my sister teaching it to me. And then I went ahead and... and searched youtube for a quick and easy guide and i found an even quicker guide than oh, wow, i that's needed. amazing and yeah we also have pillow mist which uh, i i really thought about you while writing this one Alex, <laughs> because i know your house is full of, of oils essential oils and, oils. and herbs <laughs> and um, i know your mom loves scents and stuff so yeah, this made does. me think about your mom and then yeah. we have the diy box of chocolates and last but not least how to put them all together in a little fun bag or basket for your mom. I really like that idea, actually. So, you know, look, we obviously link down below to all of the stuff that we're talking about now. The nice thing, though, is that they're all really quick and easy to do. So this would be like max, you know, two hours. And you'd have, what, five cool gifts to give to the mom in your life? Exactly. So, yeah, definitely you know, check it out if, you, if, if you're at all interested in DIY. And hopefully most of you are, given how we are in lockdown. And <laughs> uh, buying things is somewhat limited at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Now, something interesting that is a little bit related is we're speaking about the, the cookie dough, right? Yeah. Now, one of our listeners, TJ from Australia, actually DM'd us. And he brought to attention something called the Netflix and chilled ice cream from Ben and Jerry's. And, oh, it looks amazing. I've said it's <laughs> limited, though. Yeah, it's limited. And according to Ben and Jerry's, their whole inspiration behind the Netflix and chilled ice cream is to satisfy people who have any sweet or salty snack cravings. Because, you know, sometimes they happen at, like, exactly the same time. Yeah, yeah. So the flavor that the Netflix and chilled with three L's, <laughs> is going for, is peanut butter ice cream with sweet and salty pretzel swirls and fudge brownies. Mm. Now, I'll be honest, that sounds amazing. It does. Okay. What doesn't, and TJ from Australia agrees, is the name. Because anybody who be really Netflix and chillin' gonna know that it don't taste nothing like this. <laughs> Okay. Sweet or salty. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could taste either sweet or salty, I suppose. <laughs> you are with meat, after all. Oh my gosh, Edward. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you say it like that. <laughs> anyway, um, as Edward mentioned, it is a very much a, a limited edition flavor. Um, and I guess, like he said, <laughs> depending on what you eat, <laughs> it yeah. could be sweet and salty. Well, given how we're on that topic now, okay. Um, I think there was something else that that we discovered. Edward, do you want to just take it away since this is often your forte <laughs> every every episode? I'm, be- I'm becoming the NSFW segment. <laughs> so today on the NSFW one, <laughs> you porn debuts wheel a foreplay for couples Ooh. in isolation and solo lovers. <laughs> I love yeah. that they add solo lovers to the end. Yeah, they have to. I mean, not all of us are lucky enough to to. Do the isolation thing together, you know? Yeah, so the Wheel of Foreplay <laughs> is essentially the X-rated counterpart of Wheel of Fortune, which... That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it's split into different categories for everyone's preferences, uh, whether they be sexual or just for fun and desire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, basically, according to YouPorn, visitors of, are urged to consent to their partners to play the game. Um, obviously. Obviously, you always need consent. Obviously. Um, there's nothing more sexy than consent. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So like Edward is saying, there are a lot of interesting options in terms of this wheel of foreplay. Um, things like there's going the distance, right? Which yeah. is for couples who are isolating away from each other. I think that's mm-hmm. quite quite cool. You know, that makes sense. You know, do something yeah. cool. And then there are other topics like some like at heart and erotic intelligence and cosmic, cosmic connection. connection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure <laughs> what that means exactly. But, you know, given how aliens exist now, right? After last week's episode. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. And also definitely stay tuned because we have more news about this later on in this episode. <laughs> I guess uh, uh, you porn is uh, quite on the nose uh, yeah. on the situation, right? Once again... A triple X company is doing stuff <laughs> no one no one asked for but everyone wanted. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you know what else no one asked for, Hans? Uh, no, I was I was just getting to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Midnight Sun by Stephanie Mayer. Okay. Right. For like but, okay. 13 years now. <laughs> but in that respect, let's be honest, people really wanted it. I mean, that's why it was leaked in the first place. And then she was all like, oh no, I'm not going to do it anymore and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, woe so, is me. Oh. <laughs> so in last week's episode, we actually mentioned how there was a countdown on Stephanie Mayer's website. Yeah. And we, you know, postulated what it might be. You know, could it be Midnight Sun? Could it be a new host or a movie or a TV show? Something like that. Turns mm-hmm. out it is officially Midnight Sun. Yes. Which, again, when we spoke about it last week, we actually were a little misinformed. And so today we're going to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> As all good journalists do. As it so happens, there already is a book available called Life and Death Twilight Reimagined, which yes. gender bends edward and bella whereby bella is now the vampire and edward is the human and it retells the original book just from a slightly different perspective yes now midnight sun is not that essentially midnight sun is twilight but told from edward the vampire's perspective yes so it's very much like the recent gray novel it tells the story from his perspective. So Stephanie May is essentially doing the same thing. Or rather, I should say, she had the idea first. The manuscript leaked. She got upset about it and decided not to write it anymore. I have a little fun fact for you on that, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Turns out Fifty Shades of Grey started its life as a Twilight fanfic. No! Yes, I, I, I swear to you, this is true. And what? also... Now that you mentioned there's a, a new Grey book from his perspective, it's clear that whoever wrote... No! Are you are you certain about this? Yes, I am 100% certain. So, hold on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Stephanie Mayer is to blame for sparkling vampires and kinky BDSM sex <laughs> in books. Is this... <laughs> uh, pr- pretty much. <laughs> like... I don't know if it if it um, began life. Uh, so sorry, I don't know if the fanfic used to be a BDSM thing until it turned. You into know, that. now that you mention it, now I will happily admit I've read the first two books in the Fifty Shades of Grey saga, yeah. and there are some similarities between Christian Grey and Edward Cullen, just in the in the way that he's you know very stoic and doesn't share emotion and you know that kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. Bella and Anastasia are both useless. I say this because (laughs) they're both not really powerful in the way that a woman is today in 2020. You know, they both submit to these men, which with the exception of Bella and Breaking Dawn, you know, where she does come into her own, but she needed to be a vampire first. You know, it would have been nice if she could have shown more initiative as a human. Anyway, I'm digressing now. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the Twilight books. Um, it, they are far better written than anything Fifty Shades of Grey. And now that you say that it was Twilight fanfic, whether that's true or not, I want to believe it because those books are terribly written. <laughs> okay. Um, say what you want <laughs> about Stephanie Mayer, but her Twilight saga, even the host, now I haven't read anything else of hers, but they were good. 
they were genuinely good and, and well written in my opinion i mean not expertly written but well written you know pleasant easy to understand engaging and that's what you want yeah exactly i mean it's yeah. it's easier to get into something like that than something like the hobbit you know like i've had a lot of people who have read the hobbit books and the lord of the rings books and obviously watch the movies and have become subsequent fans but i just haven't been able to get into it um i find it very very intense i guess that's maybe just because you know where we are today where you know things are it's easier when things are quicker and you know taking that a moment's glance yeah i don't want to feel like i'm studying a manuscript yeah yeah, yeah. i i get that now of course e- each to their own if you've read it and you've enjoyed it that's great and you know maybe one day in the future i'll eventually get to it because i do understand that books are always better than the film counterparts with the exception of and i know because we're still on twilight new moon that movie was leagues better <laughs> than the book yes. ever was yeah okay and that's because jacob is a little bitch boy <laughs> okay <laughs> And he was so well, irritating okay. in New Moon. At least in the movie, he was fixed. While yeah, we're talking yeah. about movies, and I've mentioned Lord of the Rings, you discovered something really cool this week. Yes. Um, it's actually going on as okay. we speak. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Hans and I are recording this at 12 p.m. And Andy Serkis is giving a continuous reading of The Hobbit as we speak. It's, it literally started... Well, there we go. Ago. If you don't want to read it yourself, why not be read too? Exactly, by the Gollum himself. Oh, do you know what that means? Yeah. He can do the voices. Yeah, he, he will oh, be doing Gollum. Um, he said specifically that he won't be doing voices for all the other characters just because he, he w- number one, he'll be busy for a, about 11 projected wow, hours geez. Um, reading this. And number two, he feels that the, he, he doesn't want to take away from the original cast. I understand that they're all quite close knit. So, so that's actually a very respectable decision yes. on his part. They're apparently one big family. Um, now, um, I also understand that this is for charity, right? Yes. Um, it's for both the NHS charities together and the best beginnings, okay. um, of which Andy Circus is an ambassador. He keeps tweeting about them and everything, which is amazing. He also has a GoFundMe page where um, they both have the stream hosted. And where you can donate if you like what That's he's awesome. reading. Okay, well, as always, um, yeah. there will be a link below if you'd like to watch it live. Yeah, it, it will be live for at least another half a day. So <laughs> Now, speaking of books and being read to, do you know that Daniel Radcliffe is currently reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone? I heard something about that, but I don't know the Yeah, it, it's really cool. So, okay, granted, unlike the Lord of the Rings cast reading for charity, the... Harry Potter cast are coming together for the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Now, my understanding is that they are doing this content in order to allow everyone around the world to enjoy the Harry Potter saga while being stuck in quarantine. And although Daniel Radcliffe has started to read the first couple of chapters of Sorcerer's Stone, now I do know that over the coming weeks, um, the other 16 chapters will also be read by fellow Harry Potter alumni. And this includes Eddie Redmayne from Fantastic Beasts, um, Noma Dumadzweni from Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, Stephen Fry from the Harry okay. Potter audiobooks, and Claudia Kim from Fantastic Beasts and the Crimes of Grindelwald. And a whole lot of other people as well, including David Beckham and Dakota Fanning. So it's definitely something to, yeah, to look out for. And the first book is the gateway drug to Harry Potter. So (laughs) although this is cool and all, I know that J.K. Rowling is just, you know, waiting to roll into more billions through this. Because once you've you've listened to the first couple of chapters, you're going to want the rest. And there you go. You're going to buy into it. (laughs) And you know what? It's totally worth it. It's 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 exceptional. <laughs> well, to to be fair, um, you mentioned Eddie Redmayne and Fantastic Beasts. I personally only like the original series and not the new books that um, Rowling has. Or rather, okay, so just to clarify that, she hasn't actually really added anything new, with the exception of Cursed Child, which is a screenplay. Uh, the Fantastic yeah. Beasts is actually developed from the book Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, and. I mean, yeah. years ago, probably so, about um, 15 years ago, the book came out. It was really small. You know, it was maybe, what, like 30, 30 pages at, at most. And it was sold for mm. charity. So, she, you know, she has taken that and expanded upon it for the Fantastic Beasts franchise, which I, I must admit I'm not too keen about because I haven't enjoyed the movies either. Um, you know, you, yeah, you can tell yeah. they're quite hollow. You know, they're not drawing from a lot of inspiration. Like, they haven't really been built up. Exactly. 
that's yeah. my exact feel Look, with it. that aside um i do hope that at some point ralph fines will also read from the first book because he was voldemort oh, yes perhaps not in the first movie yes. but from the second movie onwards and you know he did a great job of personifying the character and this is now going to lead me on another train of thought but just you know just bear with me here so uh-huh. Voldemort actually is how you're supposed to say it, but we you know Voldemort is how everybody knows. Was hardly seen in the first film or the first book. He was spoken about, but he didn't really have a presence until the very end. And this really made him a proper villain. You know, he really was an entity to be feared because he wasn't around. You know, he was always just mentioned in the shadows with a name that could not be said and you know when i thought about that i was kind of wondering about other characters from horrors and uh, science fiction and thriller films and what i came to realize is that a lot of the really truly scary moments in films you know the, the ones with true horror actually feature monsters or enemies for very very little on screen time Mm -hmm. yeah i just i thought this was fascinating and so i decided to to look into it a bit more and i found out that like take darth vader for example he is iconic he is legendary and he was not necessarily feared by movie watchers but he was feared in the star wars universe do you know that he only had eight minutes of screen time in the original 1977 movie i did not <laughs> exactly now now just 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 think about that for a second one of the most iconic characters of science fiction history was only shown for a total of eight minutes in the first star wars film that ever debuted wow and that solidified him as a proper villain somebody to be feared and to watch out for and the more i looked into this the more similarities i found like for example in the original alien film with the xenomorph yeah do you know that it was only shown for four minutes in total that makes so much sense actually the same applies to jaws the shark only for four minutes of total screen time it's so weird because in retrospect it in my memories it's like forever yes it, it feels like you always see these characters yeah and yet if you actually go back specifically to the characters that are most memorable you know people like hannibal lecter or Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. Now, they all appeared for very short amounts of time. So Hannibal Lecter was only shown for about 16 minutes, whereas Heath Ledger was only in the film for about 33 minutes, and that film was about two hours long. Wow. So it just goes to show how suspense can be built around characters when you don't see them. That's amazing. Like, uh, while you've been speaking, I've been looking at the Voldemort screen time. Yes. And even in the very last Harry Potter, like <laughs> I specifically looked for Goblet of Fire, but I got them all. Yes. Even in the very last Harry Potter film, the one featuring Voldemort to, its, to his most extent. Yes. Voldemort himself was only in the movie for ten and a half minutes. Isn't that unreal? It's amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It's actually super amazing. I'm mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> look, it, what's nice to see this is that, look, this kind of a style of filmmaking was actually pioneered by Steven Spielberg. Even Jurassic Park, the film, doesn't showcase the dinosaurs that often. It's actually more hmm. of a human driven plot. And when the dinosaurs appear, obviously they're terrifying or you stare in wondrous awe. Now, of course, I'm talking about the original film now. I'm not talking about the later yeah. versions, which have so much action that you kind of just roll your eyes because the yeah, wonder yeah, of the yeah. dinosaurs has gone out the window. Now, speaking of Steven Spielberg, the reason why I like the man so much, or why I've always liked him, obviously, is because of Jurassic Park. But it's because of his way of creating suspense or wonder with minimal screen time. And something else that is fascinating about the director is how he also used music and audio to create the suspense. And with that in mind, one of Steven Spielberg's favorite composers is none other than John Williams, an absolute icon. And I just want to mention this quickly because there's this wonderful quote that Steven Spielberg said about him. And it goes as follows. Without John Williams, bikes don't really fly. 
nor do brooms in Quidditch matches, nor do men in red capes. There is no force. Dinosaurs do not walk the earth. We do not wonder. We do not weep. We do not believe. And Steven Spielberg said that about John Williams when he was awarded his 2016 Lifetime Achievement Oscar. So just, so, I mean, I know that we just got off on a bit of a tangent and I'm going to come back to where we actually need to go, but it's just fascinating how minimal screen time and audio cues can create suspense or even action. Because John Williams also created the score for Mission Impossible. And I know this is, you're going to lead us into the next topic. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Mission Impossible was an amazing movie and it starred Tom Cruise. What else is starring Tom Cruise in the near future (laughs) is a movie made in space. Legit space. Now, yeah, legit space. No. No. Yes, I, I don't listen. I don't know why this is even a thing. Um, I feel it's super unnecessary waste of money. But <laughs> Tom Cruise and Elon Musk are teaming up to shoot a movie in outer space, and I don't know. It's this is incredible, and this will be a first. Yes, it, obviously, oh, it obviously, will be, uh, <laughs> a y- humanity first, and I don't know. It's it's just weird. Look. Of all the people to do it, I wouldn't put it past Tom Cruise. This makes a lot of sense. I mean, the guy eats placentas for breakfast. So, I mean, (laughs) he's definitely... And we all know that he's a proper, proper stunt machine. He does all of his own stunts for all of his films. So, it makes perfect sense that he would want to do this. I mean, he's already flown, as far as I understand, actual fighter jets. Yes. Especially for the new Top Gun Mavericks, which I'm very excited for, by the way. And so I guess this is just the evolution of Tom Cruise. Space, the final frontier. Yes. <laughs> uh, like it makes total sense why he would be he would be the front runner for this kind of stuff. Um yeah, I don't know. Um apparently they said um Cameron might be up for it, but it's still all up in in Cameron, it's not James Cameron from Avatar. Oh, James Cameron. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, but we don't know. It's obviously still in super early development. And of course, Elon Musk, right? Yes. Of, of all course. the people, it would be him because of SpaceX and the advancements that he's making with the Falcon engine and so on and so forth. <laughs> and the the legacy he's oh, leaving behind. Oh my gosh. <laughs> gosh. You, your your comment was brilliant to me earlier this week when you were like. Hey, Elon, your alien is showing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It really is, though. Look, for those who aren't aware of what we're talking about, um, yeah. Elon Musk and his partner Grimes recently had a child. Yes. And they have named it... I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Some people are saying Kyle. What? Because how are they getting Kyle? Weird <laughs> pronunciation. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so according to a, a tweet from Grimes, uh, let's break down the name. <laughs> the first letter of the name is X. It's an unknown variable. The second letter of the name is R, which it's it's a Gaelic and Germanic. Um, it it like looks like an A and an E together. Yeah, and that that's her Alvin spelling of the word AI. Which is love and or artificial, artificial intelligence. intelligence. Oh, I can't. And then the third letter <laughs> of his name or the child's name is A12. A-12. Is dash 12. Pre- Don't forget the dash, hey? <laughs> yes, sorry. A-12. Uh, which is the precursor to the SR71. Um, she, she tweeted 17, but it's actually 71. All right. Which is both her and Elon's favorite aircraft. Um, it, it, it's... Just a quick aircraft, I suppose. Okay. And then, yeah, and then A, which, which is the last letter, which means Archangel, which is her favorite song. And together, I don't know how they pronounce it, but people on the internet are saying it's Kyle. How, how do you get I, Kyle from XA12? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, because you said the AE is, is, is R, it's right? It's R. So yes, it's you it's, pronounce it R. And X can sometimes be pronounced as Z, like xylophone. 
Yes. So I would be like, za 12. <laughs> yeah, like, za 12. <laughs> za 12. So your your za 12. sandwich is ready, my child. <laughs> Zatalv has know. arrived to take over the world. <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> Look, li- I don't want to make fun of a child for his name. Of, but I mean, of course it's, not. It's, it's not his so, fault. It's such a weird ass name to give someone. After the announcement, I actually looked up a little bit more about the child's name. And it just so happens that because of where he was born, which is in the state of California in the United States, they actually aren't allowed to name the child this. Because they don't oh. allow um, dashes or strange characters or anything like this. So there's a very good possibility that Zotelv is actually going to be <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> That's so weird. Well, like, okay, I get naming your child weirdly is, is weird and you really shouldn't do that. But why would a state not allow for that? It's just a name. Because America. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I, it's, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, the land of the free guns and coronavirus. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, guns and police. Sorry, I mean, I, yeah, I shouldn't, I, we shouldn't be making light of this. But <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm not sure what the reasoning is. I just assume it's to make it easier to pronounce names. It is a bit strange because, you know, they don't even allow accents. So if you're a French speaking person and you wanted to, accent certain letters of a name you aren't allowed to either um wow. you, you, you can make an appeal obviously uh, but it just seems like an unnecessary extra step california is a weird place man well that's just the states you know united states every state has its own laws yeah yeah okay cool something else i just want to bring up quickly uh we had somebody else message us over the last two weeks and it was yes. something that i was meant to speak about last week and edward very kindly reminded me <laughs> that <laughs> i had to get it done for this week now the post is still incoming because i've been quite busy doing a lot of other things namely stats um, edward knows all about this yo life happens so. life happens life happens but i'm going to speak about it anyway and this comes from david in south africa who actually messaged us and asked me in particular about the setup that I have for shooting videos and also for game streaming. And I thought, you know what, let's actually just speak about this for a second, because I assume a lot of people out there think you need a lot of equipment in order to stream games. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is you actually don't. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a very quick brief rundown. If you want to read it more in detail, there will be a link, but Overall, all you need is a decent laptop or PC, um, even a, even a MacBook if you if you like. Free software, namely OBS, which stands for Open Broadcaster Software, and a modern cell phone. And you also need a good internet connection. And that's about it. Pretty much. So essentially, look, look. There's obviously more to it than that. Like, if you want to capture games consoles, you then need a capture card. But I'm yes. talking about trying to do streaming from a very basic perspective. And if you want to, you can just do it immediately with what you have. So if you've yeah. got a PC, just play whatever games you've got. You don't need to have the highest spec PC or show off the highest graphics. So if you've got a mid-range laptop or PC, you know, you can play whatever game you like on there. And also this is very important. If you do want to stream stuff to an audience, it's not as lucrative as many people make it out to be. But if it is something you think you'll enjoy, you should do it. Give it a shot. You've got nothing else to lose, especially in lockdown and quarantine. So do it. Who knows? Maybe you'll get your own audience. And this is what's most important. You must play what you enjoy. Don't try Mm -hmm. and fit in with what everybody else is doing. So if people are playing Call of Duty, don't just try and fall into the crowd unless you actually like Call of Duty. So for myself, for example, I do want to stream. Unfortunately, I have to stream from my consoles because that's where I have majority of my games. And I need a, a capture card for that. But that's my own my own dilemma now i enjoy um rts games and world building so that's what i would play that is what i would stream now Mm. i'm getting a bit off topic but what i'm trying to get at is if you are a beginner and you want to do this you just need obs a laptop um a webcam but you don't need a webcam if you have a smartphone and essentially all of these devices can work together to allow you to stream online and it's actually far simpler than many people imagine and also you should use what you've got instead of spending money on something you may not do for the long term yes 
don't go all in. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, there is uh, far more information um, in the post itself, which we will link. And thank you, David, for you know posing this question to us and for getting us to write about this. And I hope that your streams go well in the future. <laughs> yeah, we'll we we'll tune in, maybe follow. Well, look, since we're on the topic of games, uh, just another quick one. The first episode of Xbox 2020 aired. And Microsoft made quite a big deal about it. They spoke about how they're going to show some next-gen gameplay. They didn't. But they... <laughs> they <laughs> well, they did. Okay, look, if you if you call what they showed gameplay, sure. But it didn't... Okay. <laughs> at, at the very least, I'll call the Bright Memory trailer a gameplay trailer. That looked like all gameplay to me. Okay, that is true. And I think what's most impressive about that is how... It was all developed by one man. But we're not going to get too yes. much into the specifics yeah. of every game. Yes, yes. We're just going to give a rough overview of what the event was about. And essentially, it's the first footage we've seen from Xbox Series X. Mm -hmm. And although it's not as much of a generational leap as people were hoping for, what most people don't realize is that that's not what the next generation is about. Sure, it is partially visuals and them looking better. And overall, yes, what we saw looked very pre-rendered even though according to microsoft it wasn't yes the real benefits of next gen though are going to be in the cpu allowing for crowds you know more more npcs on screen at once you know better hair physics and so on and so forth as well as basically eliminating loading which yep. is something only nintendo consoles have in the past sort of enjoyed you know whereas playstation and xbox have always had games that load yes now these are difficult elements to portray in gameplay videos and I assume that the feedback from this event will sort of re-gear how Microsoft is going to show features going forward. With that in mind, they did show, I think it was 13 titles, of which 10 yeah. are Smart Delivery enabled. And I just want to mention this quickly, because Smart Delivery is Microsoft's term for you buy the game now on your Xbox One, and should you upgrade to Series X in the future, you will get the Series X version of that title, meaning it'll be Series X enhanced, you know, with better textures, etc., etc. And I actually love that about the messaging that Microsoft is going for. Because yeah. Sony is still remaining totally mum on even backwards compatibility. Sure, they've said that there'll be a bunch of titles available, but they haven't gone on record to really specify them. Yeah. And, you know, that this is a bit concerning because Sony's been very quiet. They're still pushing PlayStation 4 and leaving everybody hanging by a thread for PS5. I'm of the opinion that this is because the company sort of rested on its laurels for being ahead of the previous generation versus Microsoft mm -hmm. with Xbox. And so they've, you know, taken it much easier. Whereas Microsoft has come out guns blazing, you know, with their messaging, with smart delivery, with Game Pass, etc., exactly. etc. Cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, Smart Delivery is fantastic. I love the fact that Assassin's Creed, Call of the Sea, Chorus, Cyberpunk 2077, Dirt 5, Scarlet Nexus, Second Extinction, The Ascent, Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines 2, and Yakuza Like a Dragon, which are all next-gen titles, which are also going to be on current-gen, are all Smart Delivery enabled. Yep. Now, there is one title that was announced from EA which is not smart delivery in April. No. Um, so, in this entire Inside Xbox 2020 stream, every smart delivery enabled game they showed had a little label. And when we got to the Madden NFL segment, I noticed the distinct lack thereof. <laughs> um, and then some guy came on stage. Sorry, I'm not an NFL guru or anything, so... I don't know who he was and what his role is in anything. But he came up on stage and he basically just said, listen, if you buy the, this game now, you'll get it for free when the Series X comes out. Which implies smart delivery, right? Given exactly. how every other title had smart delivery enabled exactly. and had the logo. That's, that's exactly what we assume it yeah. meant. Now, after the stream came out that no Madden NFL is indeed not a smart delivery title uh, and the thing about this get the new version of the game for free offer, limited time offer <laughs> yes is that you have to buy the game before 31 December 
and you have to upgrade to the Xbox Series X before March 2021. You know what? This is just typical EA scummy behavior. Yes. Instead of just being like CD Projekt Red or Ubisoft, which are pledging towards the smart delivery program, naturally EA wants you to shell out more money for the same damn game. And Madden of all games, as if they're any different year on year. Exactly. Honestly. So, so this means that if you are a grandma or a grandpa, or if you're not savvy with video games, if you buy Madden NFL with the big green Xbox label on it, after December for like a birthday or anything, and it turns out they only have a Series X, yeah. chances are they won't be able to play the game. That is just so scummy. Right. Look, I, I don't want to give too much airtime to EA because they're just one of those companies that just always do everything wrong and always prove how they're out to get the gamer instead of actually exactly. creating games for gamers. You know, they're always trying to yeah. get money out of everybody. Like The Sims. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of The Sims and I just don't play anymore. Why? Because they release a half-baked game where you have to then buy full price DLC in order to have all of the features that the previous version had. Exactly. And it's really just made me stop wanting to play because it's it's irritating. Yeah, because you know the next Sims game will always be half-baked compared to the previous. Exactly. Okay? It's just like, you know, they, they, they make gamers feel like we're going to have a stroke, you know, from all the stress, <laughs> yeah. you know, that they <laughs> impose on us from a monetary perspective. Gosh. I know that's a bit of a weird segue, but <laughs> um, we will, you'll understand why in a moment. Now, there's something okay. I discovered earlier this week. I'm not going to mention what it is just yet because I want Edward to actually look at it for the first time. So Edward, if you could, please bring up the image. If you're, um, if you're at home and you're listening to this, please do click on the link and have a look at the images in this link. Okay. And just me. see if you can make out anything from it. What is okay. this? Cool. So... For those of you who are listening, if you brought it up and you're looking, just look at the first image. Can you make out anything in that? I think I'm looking at like... <laughs> I think the front thing should be like a duck bill, but so, it's not. So chances are you'll actually feel quite uncomfortable looking at this image. It's because weird. it's instantly familiar, but also unfamiliar at the yeah. same time. Yes. And what this does is it gives you a sense of unease. And the reason for this is because it's an image that has been generated by an AI. An AI who's trying to piece together what the world should look like. Now, what's most interesting about this is that the AI, what, what, virus, uh, what science has actually determined, has accidentally created images that stroke victims would see when they're having a stroke. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> And it's it's really, it's fascinating. So the image apparently went viral, okay? Because mm-hmm. it's, it's like I said, it's instantly familiar, but immediately unfamiliar. And, you know, when you look at it, you just, you, you can't help but feel like an, a very weird sense of unease. And what is fascinating about it, as I mentioned before, is that this is what stroke victims would see. And so that feeling you get is how they feel when it happens to them, but they're unable to then describe it. Wow. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> yeah, like, I'm looking at the second image in the post as well. And it's literally a dog flower. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you see grass. Yes. And what should be a dog, but with, like, petally hair. And I don't even know what's in the forefront because it's just, it blurs into a new image. It's so weird. The The images were created by an AI, as I mentioned before, which is most yeah. likely part of a developing neural network called the Generative Adversarial Network. And basically what it does is it looks at images every day of everyday life, and then it tries to piece them together into reality. Of course, it's, it's failing at the moment. It's not quite getting there. But eventually in time, it will... But again, like I said, it's just very interesting because scientists looked at this and then they realized that they could actually use this to teach people about what stroke victims see. And it's just a really fascinating merger of technology and science. Yeah. And while we're on this topic of science, um, there's something else that I I came across as well. And it's mainly because 
I have always felt that I don't have good pitch when singing. Now, I mean, I don't sing very often, but you know, I like to hum, or if I'm alone in the car, I'll belt out some tunes. <laughs> but I can hear how totally off pitch I am. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if anyone else has ever, uh, maybe I'm showing my age now, but have ever gone into a music store, because, you know, granted, we didn't have music stores that much anymore today. But back in the day, you'd go in and you'd try to hum or sing a tune to try and get the person who's helping you to find the song. <laughs> I've definitely given my age away there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I've done this in the past, and of course, hummed a tune and they had no idea what I was talking about because it was so off pitch. And I then often wondered, am I tone deaf? You know, can I not do, I mean, I feel I can, but apparently when I try and sing to other people, they <laughs> say that. Well, <laughs> anyway, anyway. So I found this really cool test. It's a tone deafness test from Harvard university. And it's an experiment where they're, they're trying to obviously learn more about the human brain and how the mind works and it looks into music and how people understand it through audio perception. That's so cool. I so I did it, you know, out of curiosity. I mean, I know I'm not colorblind. Come on, we've all done colorblind tests. But, you know, how many of us know if we're tone deaf? So I did this test and I am happy to say that I'm not tone deaf. Apparently, <laughs> my score is 80% better than most other people who've taken it. And maybe it was the person in the store who was tone deaf. <laughs> maybe. Uh, well, well I, uh, I'm going to believe that because it makes me feel to better. Be, but <laughs> to be fair, um, it would have been the other person because humming and awing and singing isn't about being tone deaf. It's about being coached vocally. Whereas That's tone deaf correct, is all about yes. listening. Yes. So I think you've been lied to all your <laughs> life by this other person. Look, it, it was just interesting because it was something that I thought about myself, right? But it turns out that I'm not. Yeah. I actually, yeah. I can hear sound perfectly, actually better than most people, apparently. And of course, when I say sound, I'm talking about variations in sound. So yes. it's, it's knowing what's lower or higher than one monotonous beat. And it's a very, very cool thing. And, you know, obviously, we'll link it in the show notes. And you should all go check it out. Um, let us know what your scores are if you, if you do try it out. Yeah, I'll be doing it as well afterwards. <laughs> I'm quite curious now. You know, and again, speaking of sounds, um, you know, space makes a lot of noise. And scientists are continuously looking into space for cool sounds, namely from aliens, which the Pentagon have already said exist. Mm -hmm. uh, actually they didn't but anyway <laughs> no. well they, okay. <laughs> they they said ufos exist yes ufos exist fine fine aliens Al <laughs> <laughs> well recently there was actually a massive asteroid that um snuck past the earth it didn't yeah. you know it was a couple of millions of kilometers away and we survived and you know no issues in addition to that also in addition to that the entrails of Halley's comet were also making their way towards Earth's atmosphere. Really? Yeah. This was recent. This was this week. Uh, and they wow. created um, shooting stars, basically. You know, where That's you can cool. see it. With that in mind, you know, because obviously there is an ever-present threat that we're all going to die from, like, that we're all going <laughs> to die like the dinosaurs. There is actually a website that will show you what an impact from an extraterrestrial body <laughs> would do to your city <laughs> and it, it's 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 really it's fascinating it's called asteroid collision and you can put in like your address the size of the asteroid the diameter and so on and so forth and see the exact damage now of course it's a little bit frightening at the same time but i just found it more fascinating than anything else that's super cool yeah so essentially what you could do is you could bookmark this website and the next time NASA or some other space agency announces some sort of asteroid that's coming past Earth, put in the dimensions and see if it would be world ending. Or just this city would blazing. kill you and your family <laughs> only. It's literally the size of your house and no one else will be impacted. <laughs> now now with that in mind, and again I know we're talking for a lot of space stuff now, um I don't know if most people realize, but the moon actually acts as Earth's space defense. I mean, there are other factors, like, you know, we have the ionosphere and the atmosphere, and most asteroids burn up, you know, before they reach land. However, yep. 
the moon itself also acts as space defense. I mean, the reason why it has so many craters is because it's taken a lot of hits from possible asteroids that could have done massive damage to the Earth. And the reason why this is even more fascinating is because I found out that the moon is one four hundredth the size of the sun, but is also one four hundredth the distance from the Earth, which is why the moon and the sun look the same size in the Earth's atmosphere. I've always thought about that. Yes, right? Yeah. And what's even more fascinating about this is that we are, at least right now, the only planet in our observable universe discovered by scientists that has this exact ratio. Therefore, once again, making us truly unique. That's super cool. Right? <laughs> so not only is Luna a shield maiden of the Earth, but <laughs> she also... Uh, she's she's a, 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 a big boy, a big lady. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's just incredible if you think about the ratios. I mean, how is it that it's exactly one four hundredth the size of the sun, but then also one four hundredth the distance from Earth? It's crazy. It's super it's, coincidental. It, it's, it is divine. Edward, I'm sorry, I, I will put that out there. It, that is divine intervention, in my personal opinion. That can't just happen. At least, that's how I feel about it. Now I'm wondering, will Tom Cruise put himself one four hundredth of the way between the Earth and the moon? <laughs> but no, he'd, he'd need to be... I think that's a, that's a whole new math equation we need to work out, but I don't think it'll work like that. <laughs> could, could, you, could you imagine? Everybody would be like, look up, look up. It's Tom Cruise is exactly one four hundredth of the way between the Earth and the moon. <laughs> <laughs> like, where is he? I literally only see a dot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, well, there we go. Uh, we've reached the end of episode 13 of Gettle. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed listening to what we had to speak about today. Yeah. It was a nice varied one. I like it. Yeah, a lot. there was a, quite a lot of topics. A little bit like interesting. Lots of space. You know? and <laughs> a lot of space. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's because Elon Musk games. is always spaced out, right? I mean, that guy. <laughs> well, he seems spaced out. Well, he's either an alien or he's always high. It's one of the two. Yeah. My, uh, I think it's... <laughs> maybe it's just so smart we can't comprehend it. You well... Know? Um, I, I, I'm not sure if even Zale 12 I don't know <laughs> said the name <laughs> Kyle <laughs> Shame this poor kid honestly Yeah anyway <laughs> um, Yeah thank you so much again for, for tuning in If any of you have anything cool that you'd like us to talk about Please do send us messages um, just like this week with TJ and David. Uh, we love hearing from all of you, especially when you come from different places around the world. And it helps. You know, you help us yeah. with content, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Maybe one day we'll have a fan mailer segment. <laughs> yes. Please send money too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Send money and items too. We need it. And only fans, hey, Edward, for our feet. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so hey, listen, I'll sell my feet for 50 bucks a pop. I don't care. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, well. Um, we hope that you all have a wonderful week ahead. If you do celebrate Mother's Day, have a wonderful time. Um, if not, we still hope you have a wonderful time anyway. Yeah. And, yeah, just uh, have, have a good week. Stay safe. Stay indoors. And Edward and I will see you in seven days from now for episode boop, 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 14. One, four. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 14. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> anyway, okay. cheerio. Have a good Bye. week. Bye. Bye.